Welcome to today's Mobility Innovation Pilot of the Month webinar. Thanks for being here. I'm Rose Sheridan, APTA Vice President of Communications and Marketing for APTA, and we're so glad you're here. Our focus today is on Dayton RTA in the great state of Ohio, and then we're going to talk about their unique hands-on approach to micromobility services. Uh, as you all know, our world of mobility is changing with new innovations and services popping up almost daily. Um, so we urge you to go to our Mobility Innovation Hub on the APTA's website often for information, resources, tools, best practices, all just to you know, give you some information and keep you up to date on what's going on. Um, you'll be able to find today's webinar as well as the slides and materials on the Hub after, after this is over. So, uh, and then each month uh, we are published, we, uh, APTA highlights a new and innovative approach to service delivery or technology de deployment. And so we try to do a deep dive on, on, a, on one of these pilots and so that we make available to you in each of these case studies, contracts, data sharing, uh, procurement documents, even marketing type of materials that might be useful to you if you choose to uh, consider this idea in your community. So this is our first uh, first mobility pilot for the month, for the year, 2020. So uh, we're really excited about it. As I said, uh, these we these webinars will be announced on AppDU and through the APTA materials over the over the coming months. So please keep uh, keep looking for the schedule. And and we'll, and also we're very interested in your ideas. If you have ideas of of what you'd like us to cover, please uh, please let us know that too. So let's get started. I'd like to introduce uh, each of our speakers for today. Uh, let's welcome David Zipper, DC Strategies from Washington, DC, who uh, works with APTA on shared mobility. Um, our next speaker is Mark Dunnegy, Chief Executive Officer from the Greater Dayton Regional Transit Authority. And with him is Brandon Palchicchio, Chief Customer and Business Development Officer, also for RTA. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to David Zipper, who I mentioned uh, works with APTA on shared mobility options and innovation. Great. Thank you so much, Rose. It's a pleasure to be with everybody on today's webinar. Um, as Rose said, I, I work with APTA a lot on these new mobility technologies, and I'm also a visiting fellow at Harvard and the Kennedy School focusing on technology and transit. There's a lot to unpack. And today we have a really exciting topic to go into, which is uh, how the, the transit agency, RTA, in Dayton, Ohio, has developed what I think is truly a groundbreaking approach toward micromobility, both with bike share and with e-scooters. And we have uh, the, the right two people to, uh, to talk about it with us. Uh, good, next slide. Oh, um, so, but first, I want to just make reference to this, uh, this memo, which is sitting here, which summarizes everything we're going to be talking about today in the webinar. This is uh, the, 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 a summary of, of, of of, the, of what Dayton has done uh, around micromobility, and it's available on the Mobility Innovation Hub on APTA's website. So if you're interested in getting more information after the webinar, or if there are people that you'd like to share it with, I highly encourage you to visit APTA's website, download this document, and some other documents as well. Please go on, next slide. Because uh, our friends at RTA have been especially generous this month in sharing a variety of documents with APTA members that might be interested to go deeper into, into micromobility. Uh, if you, if you, there's, there's links to all of these, these documents on the Mobility Innovation Hub for APTA. It includes contracts, operational documents, and procurement agreements for both the, the as we'll talk about shortly, Dayton's Link Bike Share Program, as well as the SPIN e-scooter agreement. So thanks in, uh, again to, to uh, RTA for sharing these documents, and I highly encourage APTA members to make use of them. And there'll be, I'm going to, we're going to have a, a short presentation in just a couple minutes. Then I'm going to sort of seed the conversation with a few questions of my own. And then there'll be ample opportunity for you all, the audience or attendees, to ask questions yourselves. You should see a box right in front of you, a question box where you can be asking questions at any point, actually from now on. So please, uh, as questions arise, put them right there. And Rose is going to be keeping an eye on submissions and we'll be able to go through as many of them as we can. And now with that, uh, let me turn things over to, uh, uh, to Mark 
and to uh, Brandon in Dayton, and we'll dive right in. Over to you guys. Well, thank you so much, David, and uh, we're thrilled to be here as well. We're here in Dayton in the great state of Ohio. Yes, it is. Uh, the home of the Wright brothers, of course, the great transportation pioneers, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, the poet, and I got to get a plug in, the UD men's basketball team doing extremely well this year. It's a great, great place. It's also a great transit city. We are one of the five, only five cities left in the U.S. that operate overhead infrastructure powered trolley buses. We have 124 miles of active wire on seven routes. And now with our new dual mode next gen project, we have buses that run up to 20 plus miles off wire, uh, which has enabled us to restore some routes that were once trolleys back to trolley service and, uh, and add a couple more. So like most of you, we do the, the typical things. We have a paratransit operation. We have fixed route. We do circulator service. We do cross county service. On the average day, today's a good example. We will carry over 30,000 people. Two-thirds of those, of course, are going to or from work. We've got about 800 people on average on our paratransit system. That's the ADA side. But we really want to talk today about some of the new and different things that we're involved with. And if we can just go to the next slide, I'm going to jump right into that. So a number of years back through our strategic planning process, we wanted to become more and more part of the fabric of our community here in Dayton. And uh, the end all be all for us was this idea or vision of ours, which is universal access for all people that live in this region who need transportation of any type. So to do that, as you can see in the slide, we felt we needed to embrace the entire network of transportation options, everything from uh, the hated car to what we do primarily, which is our big bus and paratransit service, and then expand that to the alternative services we've been involved with, including expanding well beyond the requirements of ADA required paratransit uh, to serve the entire area. And then more recently, uh, the engagement of net transportation network companies, both Uber and Lyft and local private companies work with us to help supplement our services, what we call on-demand service in certain areas of our region. And then, of course, the two we're here to talk about today, the bike share program, and then ultimately our arrangement with Spin Scooters. Uh, I've been really excited about this because as we've gone, we're fortunate here to have a board of nine members appointed from throughout the region, but they're very forward-thinking people. And all of you out there who work with boards in the public sector know uh, some of them can be very risk averse uh, and would like to just stick to what we do traditionally. We've had very good success here in selling our board on the need for us to be out front in supporting the other portions of the network. The first big one for us was the bike chair program in 2015 in our town. Uh, the, we own the assets. We own the bikes, the stations, and we actually maintain them. We have a bike shop that's actually one floor below where Brandon and I are sitting in downtown Dayton. So we do all of that work, and then we partner with some other local groups, primarily a third party called Bike Miami Valley, who handles the administrative side and the fundraising aspects of the operations. I can tell you that our board wasn't excited in the beginning, and we sold it to them as, as an important first last mile uh, connection for the general public, which would help encourage the use of our system and uh, I have to tell you, it, uh, locally, uh, we won great praise. I think the way we've structured the program is a little different than in a lot of cities, and it was intentional so that we could keep the cost to the consumer down for the program. It's become a great uh, physical asset in the community. But again, couldn't have been done without the leadership of our board. And I must say that later on in the past year, when we went back to them and said, hey, scooters are coming to town, you know, we, we need to work with this as just one more form of transportation within the network. And while we had plenty of questions about why should we be involved and, you know, will this hurt the bike share and will this hurt our other services, including our downtown circulator? In the end, the board supported us going forward and we've had another successful launch there. So with that, I, what I'd really like to do is go to the next slide and turn it over to Brandon. We, we like to think we're all things Moz and Dayton. Uh, we couldn't do it without Brandon leading the effort for all our all of our alternative services here in Dayton, Ohio. So, Brandon, take it away. 
As Mark mentioned earlier, our goal is to really be a one-stop shop for customers in this region for all things mobility, either by going to an application to book their trip across one mode or multiple modes or calling our call center and arranging trips in that manner. We've developed four goal outcomes of our mobility as a service project and what we're intending to do. And everything that we approach and do as it relates to technology, taking on mobility services or partnering with other mobility services, we make sure that they align with these four categories and that in turn, even our internal policies and procedures related to MOS also align with these as well. Um, and what was great about the partnerships that we've had with the bike and the scooter program is that for the number one outcome there, we were able to work with the city of Dayton and through our partnership with Transit App, we're able to develop great um, technical integration requirements, which the city of Dayton worked with us on and actually put into law into their regulations for the operation of bikes and scooters, but also what the technology integrations look like in terms of being able to support a multimodal service application. As some may know, often the challenges of requiring third parties to integrate to be able to do multimodal trip planning, we've made it such that it's actually a part of the deal here to operate within the city of Dayton and receive the permit to be able to do that. So that's just one example of our outcomes um, that we've been able to achieve through this partnership. Next slide. And actually, before we go on, um, this is David again. Just one fact that Mark mentioned briefly that I think is so unique for Dayton, and I think it's an enabler of what we're going to talk about a little bit later with micromobility partnerships, is I think, Mark, you mentioned that RTA manages a bike repair shop in your own headquarters that's open to the general public. Is that right? And if you just tell us really quickly a little bit about why you did that. And we absolutely do, and it is open to the public. There, there were no bicycle shops within the core area of the Central Business District, and uh, initially we talked about partnering with one of the local privately owned shops. Uh, that what we weren't able to bring that to fruition, so we decided that our contribution to the ongoing cost of bike share. Now the original assets were actually funded by federal highway dollars that were transferred over to us through our uh, MPO here in the region. And then the city put up the entire local match against those dollars. So then we decided as an organization, our contribution to the ongoing operations would be the bike shop itself. So we, but we the space we already owned, but we fund uh, two to three technicians that work on the bikes and do the bike balancing. So that's our in-kind contribution on an ongoing basis to make this work. and. Uh, uh, we'll be happy to share some pictures or images of our bike shop if people would like it. It's a full-service bike shop. Not only takes care of the bike share bikes, but uh, we take care of any sort of emergencies that people have in our region. You know, our region, most people may not be aware, we have the, the highest number of miles of paved bike trails in the United States right here in the Miami Valley. Great. And you have a nice name for your bike shop, if I'm not mistaken. What's it called? The right stop bike shop. <laughs> ah, it's a good dad joke. I like it. Um, can we? Uh, well, why don't we keep going? Brendan would love to hear your uh, sort of introduction to bike share and scooter partnerships that RTA has developed. So as we talked about earlier, Link is our local bike share operation. We have 225 bikes that are operated across 27 stations, primarily in the downtown area but also to um, reaches up to the University of Dayton campus who has several stations um, up there as well. The service is available 24 seven. Customers can rent via an app or at the station itself. Uh, the supplier of our stations and bicycles uh, is a company called B-Cycle. Um, and that is our current operation. What you see right now are some images from the launch that we had back in uh, 2015. Next slide. So to run down, we've touched on a few of these things, but the, really this is a, a multi-group approach to how this all came together and how it came to be in, uh, with the launch in 2015. Um, as Mark mentioned, we have Bike Miami Valley, who primarily handles the administration of the actual program itself. Um, we'll handle things like marketing, promotions, we'll handle calls from customers. They work exclusively with the actual uh, bicycle supplier company, B-Cycle. 
For RTA, what our role is, is we handle the maintenance of the bikes and the stations. Uh, we'll go out and we'll balance and move the bikes around. We'll fix the stations if they need battery replacements um, to keep those up and running. We own all of the bike share equipment, including the stations as well. We store the bikes and the stations in our properties as well. Um, initially, when this program first launched, our local MPO, the Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission, their contribution to this was they provided the office space for the Bike Miami Valley um, group, which is, ranges anywhere from three to four people um, at any time that work for that organization. And then finally, we couldn't have done it without the city of Dayton, who was uh, huge in being able to provide the local match for the program to get the program off the ground. Next slide. So for SPIN, how this all came together is, you know, rather fascinating, honestly. Um, the city of Dayton was approached by several different scooter companies um, this past summer, and the city asked, it was more of the spring, I should say, and what the city asked was is that if they could have a couple months to look at this, put together some regulations, look around the country to see what other people are doing to make sure that when the scooters came here that they were successful. We were very open from the very beginning. We just wanted to make sure to do it the right way. And how this came to be was we were in a meeting with the city of Dayton as well as Finn to discuss the potential um, accepting of a permit to operate in the area and spin had indicated you know that they were looking for people to you know look at the on ground on the ground operations and if they had any suggestions or um, people that they could look at and one of our staff members happened to be in the meeting and said well um, would you ever consider looking at us to potentially provide those services um, and it and absolutely makes sense when you look at what we do with the bike share it's really no different in terms of the scooter it's just a different mobility device um, from the bike to the scooter and really this came together quite quickly um, you know within a month or so we had everything together and we launched the service in August of 2019 in our partnership with SPIN we had a big town downtown event um, here we had a big group ride as you can see in the picture which included our our mayor and other public officials and we launched on that day with 175 uh, scooters our role with SPIN and our partnership, we handle the charging, deployment, and retrieval of the scooters every day. We have a great relationship with the city of Dayton. We work with them on locations of where they'd like to see them deployed. SPIN's been great to work with. We have weekly calls with them. They update us on things from ridership to usage. They've been great about listening to our examples of where maybe we should move deployment locations where we think they might have more success. And really the biggest thing is, is what we do is we provide an on-the-ground sort of face for the operation. When, you know, when a scooter might be parked in, you know, someone's private property, you know, we can work with that, um, you know, business to take it off and, you know, provide good relations with them, you know, to make sure that everything's working successfully here. Um, so all together, it's been a great partnership that we've had in place with them. All right. Well, thank you both <clears throat> for that, that uh, introduction. Um, just had some questions really to, to get things flowing, but before I, I get into the questions, I just want to take a step back and, and note that I think your approach for both bike share and scooters is really unique for a transit agency in the United States. I know very few examples anywhere where there, the transit agency in a city is involved in operating bike share, and I know of none where they're involved, other than Dayton, where they're involved in operating an e-scooter service. So I just wanted to make clear that what your approach is, is pretty special here. So maybe first to, to focus on the Link Bike Share Network. <clears throat> um, you know, in, in mo the vast majority of cities that I'm familiar with, it's the city and not the transit agency that's going to operate the system. So just really quick, like why did you and the city decide that RTA would be better positioned to do it? And, and, and I know you mentioned the upfront cost, but could you explain whether and how much you're subsidizing that service uh, without like in a dollar amount on an annual basis now? Sure, I'll take that one. This is Mark. Um, but, you know, when we first did it, and I would say, arguably, there's a saying around here, it's called the Dayton Way. And typically, when there's a big public project on the books or being proposed, some of the same players that Brandon mentioned always come to the table. Our local metro parks, we have a conservancy district uh, that manages our waterways, the city, the county, and a group uh, in our downtown, the Downtown Dayton Partnership. Uh, we typically seem to kind of come together on these projects, and we what we try to do is say this is how they do it across the country. And I think when we were getting ready to launch 
bike share. At that time, there were 23 active bike shares across the country. Uh, we took a look at the various operating models of each, and we stepped back and said, you know, what can we do uh, to make ours maybe a little better? So the, the primary difference being that you're right, it's mostly a city, and they usually just pay a, a third party, a private entity, to manage it all. And we said, well, what if we can take that profit motive out? Uh, could we make the bike share system a little better for our citizens and keep the pricing as low as possible? So that was the approach, and, and literally it came out in a roundtable meeting about a block from this office, and uh, I just said, you know, I'm willing to go to my board and, and see if they'll agree to let us take uh, 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 probably a bigger role than mo most thought we would. So we did that, uh, and since the time we've launched it, I think our annual commitment uh, in terms, and I, I called it in-kind earlier, but it, there's absolutely a cost to it. It's probably about $150,000 a year, uh, you know, out of our $70 million annual operating budget. So uh, it's, uh, to me, kind of a gnat on the elephant's behind. People want to always say, whoa, where are you going to get this money? But, you know, it's a tiny bit of money in comparison to the bigger picture. And then when you see, you know, what it's brought, the number of rides and our association, again, with a very positive community asset, to me, is well worth that investment. Has the, has the bike share, the link system, had a noticeable impact on your transit ridership? We haven't noticed any. It's been fascinating. Every time we do something different here, we always get that question. So first, when it was bike share, will bike share... Uh, take riders off the bus system. No, we didn't see that. Then uh, when we launched our downtown circulator called the Flyer, which connects the UD campus to the core of downtown, then it was, is that going to kill the bike share? <laughs> uh, no, it didn't. And then when the scooters came along, uh, everybody thought that was the death knell of the bike share. And the bike share has continued to uh, have at least slight growth, even in the period since we've launched the scooter and the scooter numbers are off the charts in terms of numbers of rides. And just, just to get the numbers out there, I think you said, one of you, that it's about 30,000 trips per year on, uh, on Link. How many trips is it on the Spin e-scooters? So since the Spin scooters launched in the middle of August, uh, just this past month, first couple weeks in, we passed the 20,000 trip mark. So that's over how many months? That's since the middle of August of 19. Our highest month, I want to say, we were doing close to 8,000 trips for the scooters. In a month? Okay. Okay. Yes. And you know, with, with both e-scooters and with bike share, there's a lot of interest in urban transportation circles and the idea of linked trips or multimodal trips where individuals could buy an uh, integrated ticket, if you will, for both, say, bike share and transit or an e-scooter trip and transit. Is that something that you envision in Dayton? Yeah, that, that directly ties back to, you know, our mobility as a service goals. That's where, again, our efforts with the city to require for those operating, you know, um, electric transportation devices like scooters that they're required to integrate in with the mo uh, mobility um, trip planning application, which in our case here, we're partnering with Transit App. And we've recently established a partnership. Um, Masabi is one of the companies that will be providing our fare collection system. So our goal, and I and I, I can't stress enough that our involvement with the bike share, with the scooters, all helps to correlate to that overall goal of being able to link these different modes so that people can book, purchase a pass and be able to access all these different services. And really, at the end of the day, what it comes down to is making sure we have the right, you know, policies for, you know, integration in place and the right technology partners at the table that are open to um, connect these different modes. Because at the end of the day, I think they benefit all parties. Um, and can only help grow the ridership in every different mobility mode that might be participating. And I just want to add to that because when I, when I think of this idea of universal access, so Brandon can, from his home, plan his trip on transit and eventually pay for the trip, come down here and also have paid for access to the bike, which takes him to a meeting, and then access to a scooter, which brings him back, you know, all done through the transit app from planning the trip to executing it. Are there, are there numbers or quantitative metrics that you expect to be watching closely with your board over in the coming years to see whether you're having the impact that you're looking for as you integrate 
uh, the, the ticketing and trips, like for example, it might be the percent of, of individuals traveling by car and to take trips in Dayton. It might be it might be something else. I'm curious what metrics you watch closely. Well, exactly those that you spoke of. You know, we track, uh, even though we've yet to convince the FTA that all these trips belong in the NTD, uh, that uh, we're tracking every single different trip. And, you know, and I know others like our MPO here, the Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission, they're very interested in it as well because we're going to have all this great data and our board is absolutely excited because they, they always want to see, you know, these things that we plan and we try because not everything we've tried has worked, but uh, uh, this it's a good way to quantify for them, okay, the bike share investment was good. The decision to go to the next step with e-bikes probably is a good one and, and so forth. But it's it's all those individual ridership I mowed, and then we're getting some origin and destination information as well. And just to be clear, you're going to be you're going to be adding shared e-bikes to the existing link pedal bike fleet. Is that right? That's that's correct. There'll be an expansion in the coming year. Where we'll be adding 100 e-bikes um, to the system, and then potentially um, more after that. Uh, and moving away from really a hard physical station-based system to one that's more um, remote with with geo zones that people can park the bikes in um, and they're just a less uh, costly station infrastructure price to the system where we're going to be working with a company called uh, Drop Mobility. They're uh, partnering with us on that, which that expansion will happen here um, before the summer. Okay. Just a couple more questions and then we're going to turn things over to the audience. So if you've not yet entered in your question on go to meeting please or go to webinar i should say uh please do that now uh, but but um you know just a question to, back to you guys on the downside risk is there a liability risk for either e-scooters or for um for bike share that you've assumed arguably there is i mean we've got gone out of our way uh, and b cycle was very helpful on the bike share side and spin as well i mean they've done a great job of, of, in theory, getting people to waive all their litigation rights when they, you know, uh, do what they have to do technologically to check out a bike or a scooter. Uh, we actually work with our insurance broker here to make sure that everything we do associated with these uh, different transportation options is certainly covered by our major policies, but there really hasn't been any cost to that at this point. Even though, you know, there, there's always that concern that at some point, you know, there will be an event. And when there's an event, there will likely be a lawsuit and we'll see how that plays out. Uh, my position has been, you know, we're here to do things that are right for the community. And, and, and that means we need to assume a little risk. Uh, it can't be any worse than the risk we assume when the 40 foot buses are rolling down the street with 50 people right. on board. Right. And just actually one point to clarify, too. With the e-scooter service with Spin, just want to make make sure that that uh, that, I, that there's a couple of facts out there, assuming I understood them correctly, that you're actually uh, collecting and rebalancing and doing some some charging and maybe very basic repairs from your the bike shop that you operate in your headquarters. Is that right? We're we're not doing any sort of uh, that work at that time. Um, at this time, we we work with their headquarters um, that they have one in Columbus, and we'll exchange you know broken scooters. They'll bring over additional scooters to replace our fleet. We've had initial discussions over that very you know very oh, basic okay. repairs, but it hasn't gone any further than that. But we are riding the heck are you, out of them, David. <laughs> are you managing the recharging though on a day-to-day -day basis? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And and to just understand, Spin is paying you some amount of money to do that, correct? That is correct. Got it. All right. Then the final question before I turn things back over to Rose is um, just lessons. You know, you've taken such an unorthodox approach toward micro mobility management with both Link and with Spin. Do you have one or two pieces of advice you'd give to other transit agencies in North America that are thinking about doing something similar? This is Mark. I'll I'll say this. Uh, Art knows I've been in the business a long time, about 44 years. And in looking back, I can tell you that every time I was faced with a decision that involved some risk, whether it was a new park and ride facility that was going to cost a lot of money 
or you know what we've done here, I have found that sometimes the biggest risks I've taken have been the uh, the most satisfying and successful ventures in my career. So I say to people, open your mind completely to the possibilities. You know, uh, we joke here about you know well, what's next because we're, we've been all in on everything we found. Uh, our industry is one in my mind that uh, we, we really don't like paratransit all that much. And yet here we're looking for ways to grow it. Uh, we wish to be the region's uh, actual broker for all human service transport as well. But I'd say just keep that open mind because there's always risk, but sometimes with a little bit of risk, Patrick Mahomes would probably say you get great rewards. All right, very good. Um, so I think on the next slide, we have, again, a reminder on how to submit questions. So let me turn things over to Rose uh, with some questions from attendees of the webinar. Great, great. Thanks, thanks, David, Brandon, and Mark. Um, really, really interesting. And we got a lot of a lot of questions, are particularly around operations and then funding. Um, one of the questions is, is uh, and I'll, 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 I'll put a few questions here together, is um, do you run a 12 months a year, and have you run into issues with weather? That's one question. And then the, the kind of following up that is, how do you handle customer service complaints about scooters and or bikes? So I can tell you that the, the bike share operation runs snow, sleet, whatever you, you have. Um, they're out there riding that. Um, with SPIN, oh, we're originally going to run um, for 12 months out of the year. Um, we're right now currently just in the month of February shut down. Um, we're one of those cities we've had conversations with Spin that our, our consumers just don't ride during the winter time, um, which totally understandable. We'll kick back up again in March um, with a little bit more of an expansion um, to the service. So we're excited about that. So in terms of operations, the link programs 24-7, 365. Been likely to be kind of the colder months, maybe not so uh, much. Our actual hours of operation for spin, though, end at uh, 9 p.m. and then start back up again at 7 a.m. Those are um, not by spin's choice. Those are regulations that the city um, of Dayton have put in place um, through their standards. Great. And then what about um, how do you handle the customer complaints around? How do, is that handled through your call center brand. or? <laughs> So, you know, we, our call center really, again, going back to that universal access, really will take any type of call. We've equipped our, our call center to answer some very, you know, basic questions, not into too much detail. Most questions are um, handled by um, Bike Miami Valley for the link program, and they handle those. And then for SPIN, um, SPIN will get the customer service calls or messages, and then okay, on occasion we will get a message asking to clarify a question, or if someone wants to see scooters somewhere, we might get a question from SPIN saying, you know, hey, what do you guys think about putting scooters over here? Does this, per you know, does this sound right to you guys? So, in terms of that interaction, it's very there's more on the link side, but not so much on the SPIN side. But we do get involved in if there's any sort of follow up that's needed for both of those. Great, thank you. There's there's uh, quite a few questions just again on the how you put this all together in terms of federal and local funding. Could you just go through that once more? And then also, uh, how did who made the determination on pricing and and the interest between the pricing of scooters versus bikes? Well, I'll do the uh, the, the funding part. In the beginning, we originally approached it as. Uh, we were looking for federal funding for the assets. That was our end game. And originally, our organization led an application for a CMAC grant through the MPO. And that was our target. We, we thought, uh, especially since we had the MPO at the table, that they would look favorably on that application. Uh, what literally happened uh, is that I got a call from the head of the MPO one day, and he said, we've had a highway project in our region literally came in, it was completed a million dollars under budget, and we don't want this money to go back to central, central ODOT in Columbus and never see it again. We have a small window of opportunity to transfer those funds if your organization will be the entity, and we absolutely bought into that. So that's how it happened. It was a 
They were federal highway dollars transferred through the typical process to FTA and to us. Uh, that that funded those, and I think I mentioned earlier, the city put up a quarter million in cash uh, as the local match. So we had no cash out of pocket from our organization to get it started other than a few small investments uh, in the bike shop itself. And even then, some of our people were concerned, and we reminded them that this would be the least complex vehicle that we were bringing into our fleet. So it wasn't going to take much. But that's where we did uh, – that's how we got – the funding together, and we would have been CMAC funded. My guess is we would have waited about two years uh, to get those funds to launch. So we, we gained a couple years in making that happen. And Brandon, you want to talk about the pricing? In terms of the pricing, so Bike Miami Valley um, actually has a board um, that uh, represents um, their interest and, and reviews everything that the organization does. So through the staff of, of Bike Miami Valley, as well as the board, they came up with and developed what the rates would be for the system. Um, we, Mark previously served on the board. I currently serve on the board now, uh, along with several other um, people within the community that represent different um, interest groups um, related to that. In terms of SPIN, um, we, we really have no say in the pricing. SPIN created that. Um, pricing just based off of, you know, their understanding of the market and, you know, what their costs would be. Um, they would be able to answer how they came to those um, uh, prices better than we would, but um, we had no involvement on that end. Okay. Thanks. Uh, another question or a few questions on the whole, uh, on the transit app and where that piece stands and the whole integration of, of MOS on there. Could you talk about where you stand on that part of it? So for, for two things, one for the link program, um, Drop Mobility, when Bike Miami Valley went out um, for their um, procurement to get um, a vendor to continue the program on within the specifications, they had the very same language that is found in the city of Dayton uh, regulations in regards to technology integrations, data requirements. And things like that. So, um, Drop Mobility um, is actually developing the integration to work within the Transit app um, again, so that you know I don't have to download the Drop Mobility app. I can go right to Transit. I can check out a bike, pay for it, all within one stop. I don't have to download another app. Again, with Spin, again with our work with the City of Dayton, their permit is um, to, in order to maintain that permit, they have to make sure that they re meet the regulations that are in the City of Dayton's. Um, stated regulations, which require that they are to integrate with the city's selected um, mobility uh, trip planning application. And for us, um, they default to us and that naming and that is Transit App. So um, we are working with SPIN. SPIN's working right now with a few other cities on, on a project. Um, and then uh, we'll be looking to have our integration here coming here shortly. But again, uh, the, those integration points with transit were purposefully designed, put into the different um, places that we knew they needed to be to, one, make sure everybody understood what the requirements are, and two, to make sure we could enforce it, as oftentimes mobility providers will try to skate around these items and not actually fully integrate. So we wanted to have some leverage um, for anyone, not just spin, any other scooter company, to make sure they understood that here in Dayton, if you want to play here, this is what you need to do to, in, in order to do that. And just to be clear, guys, is the vision that ultimately a resident of Dayton could use the transit app to both plan and purchase a ticket on RTA or SPIN or LINK? Correct. Any other services too, or are those the ones you expect to integrate? Well, those are the ones that, you know, we, we feel very confident in that we'll be able to integrate um, just because of what we have there. The other ones that we would obviously love to see integrate, but as many know, is the challenge right now is, is Lyft and Uber. Mark mentioned earlier, we do have partnerships, first and last mile partnerships um, with Uber and Lyft in which the customers traveling on those services, 80% of them are using those services in rural areas to get to our fixed route buses. So it's truly a multimodal first and last mile connection. So those are the partners that we would also like to see um, integrated within Transit App. But as I'm sure Transit App would uh, uh, tell you, and as many of you know, that's often a challenge 
to give up that walled garden that they have in order to integrate from that perspective. But from our end, we see it as a win-win for both groups. Um, we're, you're going to get business out of this, and so will we. Um, we just want to be able to have uh, customers go to one place in order to do that. Just following up on that, uh, so the, you, you're talking about Uber and Lyft. Do you have specific arrangements with them, or is that uh, uh, just, you know, uh, just happening in the community? We have specific uh, relationships with them. We're on, we have contractual agreements with both entities. Um, so we really only have time for one more question here, and um, there's a bit of questions around uh, just how uh, how your employees have embraced this um, and kind of the role of the employees. But also, uh, I guess a separate question, but I'll add it here, uh, is really about uh, any civil rights obligations under ADA as you manage some of these mi uh, micro mobility services. So really, two separate questions. I'll take the last one first. We we have not had any challenges yet related to ADA. We've had some talk about more accessible bicycles. They do they are out there, uh, but we haven't ventured that direction yet. As far as our employees go, uh, it's really been well embraced. One of the first things we had to do with bike share was at a station at our operating campus, which is uh, about a mile or so from here downtown. And what we found immediately was, well, one of the things we did is we integrated uh, bike share into our wellness program. So if you're, uh, if you're active in our wellness program, you get a free annual membership to the bike share. And many of our bus drivers do street reliefs here downtown at our main hub. And what we found is for that trip to the garage or from the garage, many of them wanted to just use the bike share uh, and they've embraced it really well. Scooters, uh, I would bet uh, more than half of our employees have the app, I would guess, and uh, it's being heavily used. And then some of our employees that are involved with the program, the Brandon's Group and Alternative Services, and, well, even me, we have access to the app. So it, it's getting incredible usage, and people and all our employees, I think, uh, except a few that are maybe a little older than me, have not embraced uh, the fun of the bikes and the scooters. Thank you. Um, thank you both so much. I just want to note that for those who would like to have a little more information about what, uh, what Dayton has done with micromobility or uh, would like to share information with others, there is, again, that memo that's sitting on APTA's uh, Innovation Hub, which I encourage you to check out, along with many documents that uh, have been critical to RTA's development of, of relationships or management, really, of LINK and the partnership with SPIN as well. And I want to thank again RTA, uh, Mark, and, and, and Brandon for making those available. Great. And, and again, thank you for, to everyone for listening. And really, Mark and Brandon, it's really very exciting to see this innovative partnership and uh, project underway. I just remind everyone that um, look forward to our next uh, webinar you'll be hearing about very shortly. And please go on to our, uh, as David mentioned, on to our Apta Mobility Hub. We will be posting this webinar within the next two weeks right on the web, on the uh, Mobility Hub. So thanks again, and have a great day.